He's down yeah. And, and to second that, the other uh, uh, component to that that I think we need to focus on is, uh, again, with the uh, uh, local initiatives and state and um, citywide initiatives, I think we need to focus on state and uh, city governments. Uh, one of the uh, points that, you know, you and I have talked about, one of the, I guess, uh, silver linings, if you want to call it that, obviously, uh, the election, the f however many days long we want to call it Tuesday's election, uh, it was that... Uh, the DSA really fucking delivered, man. Those candidates kicked ass in New York. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, yeah. So, again, I alluded uh, a lot of the candidates that, you know, we, talk, we talked to on the show, a lot of, you know, Adam Christensen, uh, these down these great down-ballot candidates running in congressional races. You know, Paula Jean Swearingen in West Virginia came up short. Great candidates, Kara Eastman in Nebraska. People that, uh, you know, I thought had a real chance of victory that were really exciting, uh, a lot of us on the left. Uh, th those people didn't all make it through. You know, we had Corey Bush and Jamal Bowman and Mondaire Jones. So there were some, you know, successes for sure. But uh, I think where, again, we can really look to find some really good results is even further down ballot. And I think this really just enforces the notion that, uh, you know, so much of politics, so much of actual progress does happen at just the most local level possible. And, and you know, when it comes to things like uh, state assembly, uh, state senate, these state legislatures, they have enormous impact on, you know, the people in their communities of their states. And, and sure, you know, maybe it's not the, the change or progress that uh, we want the instant gratification, uh, you know, real socialists in the Senate or whatever we may have wanted. Um, there were some really inspiring, optimistic results down ballot. Uh, the DSA, 28 of the 37 national races and eight of the nine major ballot initiatives um, which were written and organized by DSA chapters across the country, passed. Uh, of Shout course, out to Zoran and Jabari, two uh, yeah. former guests on the podcast. Yeah, in, uh, New York, in particular, quite a few um, DSA members were elected. Uh, like you said, Zoran Kwame Mandami, who we talked to on this podcast, as well as uh, Jabari Breesport, who we also talked to on this podcast, in addition to a few others in New York uh, and all across the country. So, yeah, I think this is just one of the most one of the best stories to come out of election night. And again, it's not something that enough people are talking about. I think, you know, people are so hung up on the fact that uh, certain things didn't go their way and that, you know, Biden really underperformed with certain demographics. Well, this is the way forward. I mean, uh, the DSA is showing us, you know, the, the path to success right here. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, uh, you know, for a, a number of different reasons, uh, when the DSA was first getting started, it was kind of looked down upon by people who considered themselves more serious members of the left. You know, oh, this is a group of kids. This is a group of people who aren't serious. Right. But slowly but surely, the DSA has fucking grown, man. And their power has increased in a way that the Green Party, uh, you know, has, you know, not they, the Green Party, it doesn't seem has been putting out candidates like that uh, in the way that they're, you know, building a force, building a popular momentum with young people right now. So it's super exciting to say that. Uh, obviously, you and I are looking forward to whatever comes from the uh, movement for, um, I think uh, that, oh, I guess uh, somebody pointed out that the freezing might be coming on my end. My bad, Gavin, I called you out on that for nothing. Um, but, um, uh, but, uh, Anyway, I, I think that this growth that we're seeing and uh, from the DSA and also the potential for a movement for a people's party, which I think would be two parties that could both get a lot of work accomplished together in tandem, you know, just because the MPP rises doesn't mean that the DSA has to fall. Because I do think that it is better to have a more parliamentary like basket of ideas to choose from for the American people uh, so that nobody feels like they're just like only limited to this like one super partisan um, result and also uh, you know, like I said, we've seen so much more success with ideas when they're divorced from party politics uh, or ideas that would normally be leftist politics, things like legalizing weed. And I think even if, you know, God, if we ever could get something like Medicare for all or, uh, you know, a worker driven uh, Medicare or a, a Green New Deal on a ballot, something like yeah. that. You know what I mean? And, and and yeah. And going back to these DSA victories, um, I'll pull up this Jacobin article called There Was Actually a Lot of Good News for the Left on Election Day by Lisa Featherstone. And, and yeah, she makes that point really well. Uh, here it says, you know, there wasn't only progressive decisions made by red voters. Many communities passed referendums to fund their public schools, even in conservative states like Indiana. Here it says uh, Portland, Maine joined Florida. Uh, yeah, sorry, Portland, Maine joined Florida in voting for a minimum wage hike. As oh, yeah, well. Florida raised a fifteen minimum, uh, fifteen dollar minimum wage. Yep, uh, where Joe Biden lost, by the way, and didn't campaign on the fact that he was in favor of a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Should have uh, maybe thought of that. Uh, again, um, yeah, as well as voting for a rent control again in Maine against facial surveillance and for a local Green New Deal. These are I mean, no one's talking about this, but these are huge victories 
on a local level. And again, similarly to how, you know, Colorado and Washington, a few uh, handful of states started in Texas. Yeah. Well, I was saying similarly to how those handful of states, you know, kind of started the cannabis revolution by legalizing weed on a state level. Uh, we can see concepts like a Green New Deal or um, rent control. They can become popularized on a state by state level, too, until eventually it's kind of a snowball effect. You know, a lot of times these are this is how these policies really, truly uh, get implementation in local communities. Like you mentioned, Austin, too, has had they defunded uh, the police. Yeah, yeah oh, they, that was a few they, ago, but they also had a really strong turnout for their city council elections. Yeah. Yeah. So there's so much. Um, yeah. It says here tenants were also winners in Boulder, Colorado, where voters pass no eviction without representation. This is the kind of, this is like the breeding ground of the very legislation that we need in this, at a you know nationwide level. So these local activists across the, the country in places like Boulder, where uh, they've come up with this measure to tax landlords and use the money to provide legal representation for tenants facing eviction. That's a kind of amazing policy prescription that, you know, some stupid fat cat bureaucrat in Washington would never come up with. But, uh, you know, voters and the DSA, uh, you know, chapters in places like Boulder and all across the country, uh, you know, they're coming up with these solutions that we need and, and they're popularizing them. They're making uh, the f it known that there are solutions out there and these are what they are. Um, here in Montgomery County, Maryland, um, with the DSA's help, they defeated a property tax override. Uh, Oregon voted to tax the rich and fund universal pre-K. This is crazy. Why isn't, why aren't the Democrats talking about issues like that? I mean, these are passing across the country. Um, they decriminalized a uh, number of drugs like we talked about earlier. Um, yeah, I think it just underscores that entire thing that we were making the point of earlier. When you divorce these lefty ideas from the partisan politics because the Democrats are so unlikable. That's the thing. It, it, it took a while for me to understand that, right? You know, because I think when a lot of people who, uh, you know, are going through their whole like, you know, political awakening, uh, you kind of, I mean, depending on your background, right? Um, in my mind, I, I just looked at these like, at the Democrats as these kind of like banal, spineless, kind of like, oh, they, they just have to put up with whatever the Republicans want because the Republicans are so evil, right? But then you kind of get really deeper into politics and you start to try and like pull yourself away from that and, and you want to look at everything objectively. And they're all so fucking preening and moralizing, but they're all still as soulless and without virtue and without empathy and sociopathic. Uh, and calculating and cold and Machiavellian, as, you know, and, and, and sure, they're not as open and vile and disgusting and racially race baiting as the Republicans. They've cleaned themselves up uh, largely as a party uh, in, in that regard, although it's still nowhere near where it needs to be. Right. Um, the Republicans are obviously, ob um, you know, vocally vile and disgusting. But I mean, the racism that the, you, you see from the Republicans domestically is nothing compared to the racism that both parties share uh, and, and the indifference towards human life uh, abroad, which never gets talked about by either party um, anyway. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, after Biden didn't perform as as well as, you know, some projections had, including my own, um, you know, of course, the establishment Democrats and the corporate uh, Democrats on MSNBC, people like Claire McCaskill, who we'll get to later. Uh, you know, they, they've been quick to chastise oh, the left, of course, for uh, the fact that Joe Biden didn't do quite as well. They're they're, they're going on to say, well, you know, if, if we Claire, hadn't Claire McCaskill knows how to win an election, if we hadn't, they say, if we hadn't leaned into you know all these crazy issues like defund the police and all these wild socialist rhetoric, then maybe we would have done better in places like Florida. Well, this article goes down to say. Um, you know, the original Justice Democrats, Ilhan Omar, AOC, Ayanna Presley, Rashida Tlaib, all reelected, along with Medicare for All champion Premier Jayapal and Ed Markey, Katie Porter, who's a little bit more establishment, but still, uh, you know, repped Medicare for All. She supports it. Um, she's far more uh, progressive than a lot of members of Congress. All these people that were in favor of all these supposedly electoral suicide positions, they all won. They all um, were reelected pretty comfortably. You know, Jamal Bowman, obviously he wasn't reelected, but re uh, was elected. Same with Cory Bush. So when it comes to these incumbent uh, reps and senators, uh, the issues that, you know, Pelosi would have you believe are electoral poison actually, uh, you know, brought them pretty comfortable victories. I think that uh, the fact that a lot of the people that didn't win their reelection in house were actually more milk. They were all like the establishment horseshit candidates. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I just think it's ridiculous that, you know, the American people are continually fed this line of bullshit from the corporate Democrats, basically saying that you can't have nice things because that'll prevent us from winning elections. Meanwhile, 
all the Congress people, all the senators that actually did voice their support for nice things, the things that the American people desperately need and want, uh, they got pretty comfortable re-election. And not just that, but Katie Porter, Ed Markey, AOC, uh, notice a trend here. These are the most popular people in the entire Democratic Party. These are the people that are uh, you know, revered by the youth, the people that are looked up to and idolized by young activists across the country. I mean, as we talked about endlessly, Ed Markey was a no-name until he got in favor of the Green New Deal and some other progressive policies. And now he's, uh, you know, one of the biggest names in the Senate. Uh, Ed, same with Katie, Katie Porter. You know, she her, she has so many videos that have gone viral of her chewing out, you know, fat cat bureaucrats and uh, bankers and stuff like that. This populist economic policy is literally the best way to, you know, earn you some political cred with uh, the people that actually, that aren't just your donors, you know, that aren't just the um, elite class in this country. When it comes to actual voters, uh, they'll definitely reward this kind of policy. They'll, they'll make you a fucking celebrity.